Amen. Amen. Am I though? Do I want to? Well, I do. I've prepared lots and lots. You know, there's lots of other announcements. There's probably 97 upcoming events that I tore off of Pastor Adam's page. <clears throat> if you would like to know what those events are, just look in the backs of your chairs. I don't think they're there this week, but at the beginning of the new month, they will be there for the upcoming ones that are out there. We're not going to spend 95 minutes just giving you all the announcements. You don't write it down anyway. I watch you. I do encourage you to take notes, though. How can you retain what you heard if you don't take notes? You know, in studying teaching forever, if you hear it, that gets so far in you. If you write it, that gets even farther. And then if you speak it or share it with somebody else, then you've really learned the information. And that doesn't change just because you get older. <laughs> in fact, the older we get, probably more notes we need to take. Um, just remember what that is. I don't know why I'm saying that. Last week, I talked about... Becoming a friend of God costs. I mean, I know we're doing a series in Second Peter, but the Lord is bringing this to my remembrance, so I just want to—I want to share and be faithful to that. Abraham left everything that he knew, the religion that he knew, the family that he knew, the the territory, the land that he knew. I mean, think about it. Let's say you've owned the same five acres of woods for ten years. You know every inch of that five acres, and then you go and you buy twenty new one. You got to start all over. That could be daunting. But Abraham did that, and he gladly laid that cost down and was called the friend of God. Moses likewise. Moses was raised, in a, was raised in a palace when Pharaoh's daughter took him in. In a posh lifestyle, given everything. And then he murdered a man for people who didn't even want him. Israel. And he fled the place of Egypt. And 40 years went by and he got comfortable in a new place with a wife and with children in a new land and a new job and a new religion even. Because his father-in-law was a priest of that religion. And then there was this bush that was on fire. And it caught his attention to such a degree that he turned aside. And the Lord spoke to them. Through that bush. In fact, it says, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And to be the friend of God, Moses then, to obey that voice, to be called his friend, because he told Miriam and Aaron when they were like, well, the Lord speaks to us too. And the Lord quickly intervened and said, you know what? I can speak to you through prophets and decrees and this way. But with Moses, I speak face to face. That's a friend. Moses had to face every insecurity in his life. That's the cost to be the friend of God. He went back to Egypt where he had to face the insecurity of the death penalty on his life for murdering a man. He went back to Egypt to speak when he was insecure about his ability to do so. He went back to Egypt to face a nation in Israel who didn't even want them to represent them. So he was rejected by the people who raised him, and he was rejected by the people who the Lord said he was going to lead. All these insecurities came into play, but he gladly laid them down and went, and he was called the friend of God. We can't let insecurities or fear, which is what that truly is, hold us back to pressing into the things of the Lord. When the Lord calls and draws us in that moment, in that moment is the time to act and respond. To leave here at service or to leave a meeting or to leave whatever and be like, man, I wish I would have done that. I wish I went it up. That moment is past. The Lord is a redeemer of time. But you and I have to come to the place where we can recognize the presence of God and respond properly. And so when he speaks to us in our home, and he's saying, hey, why don't you turn off TV and, and come spend some time with me? Do we? Because if we don't, then it becomes harder to hear that voice or harder to obey it in the very least. When he's speaking to you in your home and saying, you know, now's the time I'd like to share with you. Would you come and read 
in my word and come know me. But do we? That's a cost. That's a cost of becoming the friend of God. There's so many people who want to be seen or heard or shown in the church. Could you imagine if you had 100 pastors in the same church? That's not fruitful. And the Lord doesn't put it that way. I mean, at the very most, you have two big toes, not 100 of them, right? And you have two pinkies or two eyes. That makes sense when the Lord talks about the body being the different parts. But to be the friend of God, there has to be a cost that is laid down and given in private that no one knows about, not even your spouse. I made a pact with the Lord to not share as much anymore what he shows me and does with me in our private time because it's intimate. But I believe there's also a testimony to be given to encourage you to go to that place with the Lord of secret, to that secret place with the Lord. I was worshiping at a prayer time between me and the Lord not too long ago. And as I was worshiping, I shared this with Adam's father, and, and we both kind of lost it on the phone. Again, for me anyway. But I was worshiping before the Lord here in this sanctuary, which is consecrated because I was drawing near to him, so he was drawing near to me. That's you. That's in your place. Where's that in your home? Do you have that place? I've been so convicted about reading the word of God in front of a television or screen or even at my kitchen table when the kids are running around. Because I'm not totally there. I'm distracted. And that's not giving him first place. And there can only be one first place. Because if the kids are talking to me, I don't want to be rude. I want to hear what they're saying. But if the Lord's talking to me, I don't want to be rude. I want to hear what he's saying. So you have to have that place that you go to if you want to be the friend of God. There are so many things that are done in a person's life in private, you will never know the cost that they paid to be seen in public. In my own life, I didn't ask to stand on this stage. I was pushed, prodded, pulled. When I was worshiping with the Lord, my favorite song came on. It's so simple. It's You Are Worthy of It All. Anybody know that one? I love it. I could sing it every Sunday because I don't know what else to sing to him. He's worthy of it all. And in the middle of pacing this floor, I don't know how there's not a rut right here, but in the middle of pacing this floor and singing You're Worthy of It All, I'm not saying it was an audible voice, but so clearly and simultaneously while I was singing You're Worthy of It All, he's saying You were worthy of it all. He said it so clearly. My heart exploded. I didn't know what to do. I was completely undone. I started weeping. I went up there and hugged the cross and just stayed there for I don't know how long. If you'd have walked in, you'd just be like, what in the world? But it was the cost of being here because I want to be his friend. I shared this with our leadership group because another minister said it and it struck me so great. Everybody wants to be the mouthpiece of the Lord and that's easy. We can get up here and read scripture. We can declare his goodness and his works and that's a part of it. That's a part of being a Christian. But more than a mouthpiece, are you willing to be a vessel? And in order to be a vessel, you have to purge. You have to purge. Not the Lord. It says in 2 Timothy, you must purge yourself of these things. So we would be a vessel of honor ready for the master's use at any time. And he doesn't have to use us. That's the other thing you have to lay down to be the friend of God. You have to lay down the right that you feel for him to use you. That's not his number one priority. His number one priority is for you to know him and him to know you. We read about it in scripture when they said, we cast out demons in your name. We healed in your name. And he said what? Depart from me because I never knew you there's a cost that comes 
if you want to be his friend, not for salvation. Romans 3.23 is very clear. For the wages of sin is death, but the, but the salvation is a free gift that he gives you that's available to everybody. Amen? But to be his friend, it costs. Charlie said it so good in men's group, I think it was a few weeks ago when he was speaking. He said, we have this wrong mindset that to come to the Lord and to be his friend, that, it, we, have to, that we give up everything. But the truth and reality of it is we gain everything. We gain everything. To focus on what you might lose of the world because you're drawing nearer to the Lord God is like Adam and Eve focusing on the one tree that they couldn't eat from. But yet they could have eaten of any other tree in the garden. And the enemy doesn't want you to be the friend of God. The enemy will always take you and draw you to a place of focus on the one tree that is your life. What is that one tree in your life? I don't know. It's different for everybody. But there's going to be a choice in your life. God is not removing the choices in your life. We have a free will that he has given us to choose him. I mean, for you, the tree may be sexual sin or, or maybe it's anger or maybe it's pride or whatever it may be. It doesn't matter. We have to choose not that tree and choose to draw closer and nearer to him. And here's the deal. So many people that, you know, and I've been in here in this church for a long time now, and, and so has Pastor Adam, and it's, it's been over two decades. And so many people have come and wanted a place, wanted a title, wanted a position, wanted to speak, but it's evident upon their life that there's no cost that's been paid. And most of those people aren't here anymore because they didn't get that place, they didn't get that title. And a lot of them, not all of them, are in church anywhere anymore. It's, this is so in me about being the friend. And it has nothing to do with Second Peter. Or does it? See, that's the thing. It does. Because in 2 Peter chapter 2, which is our text for today, which I'm not going to get through all that. It's irrelevant uh, right now in this moment. It talks about the ungodly of the world in Noah's day. And that word ungodly in the world of Noah's day means that they lacked sacred or reverential awe. There was no fear of the Lord in their life. And it also has a connotation with that word that they threw their filthy behavior in the face of God. I don't need you. I can live this way however I want. I can live this way. Is that not the world we live in now? Is that not the world that we've always lived in? In reality, there's nothing new under the sun. And then it says in, chat, in verse 9 of 2 Peter chapter 2, but the Lord knows how to deliver, oh, we have that one, the godly, those with a sacred and reverential awe and fear of the Lord out of temptations. That's our hope. That's our hope. That should bring such a joy inside of us. That he knows how to deliver the godly. But if we're walking as godly people in reverential awe, it requires sacrifice. I was reading this week and it was in uh, Second Chronicles. It's, and it's so, uh, it's so beautiful in Second Chronicles. I'm, I'm going to turn there. It's not on your thing. Sorry, Garrett. Second uh, Chronicles chapter, I don't know, 7. That's where I'm turning. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12. I mean, there's just so much going on here in 2 Chronicles. It, it, is, it is so great. I don't recommend the first four chapters of 2 Chronicles because I fell asleep three days in a row trying to read them. Um, or maybe that was the end of 1 Chronicles. But anyway, in 2 Chronicles chapter uh, 7, David gathered supplies for the temple of the Lord. First of all, the Lord did not ask for that temple. Be careful doing something that's for the Lord that he didn't ask for. Good is not God. God is good. But just because you're doing something good, that doesn't make it a God thing. Right? It doesn't matter. Ministry, whatever. There's so many people now today. Think about it this way. They come to church and they want a place, they want a position, they want a title, they don't get it because they've not paid the cost. And so what do they do? They go on to their Facebooky 
And they go on to all their social media and they give their own self a voice to preach. They give their own self a voice to pastor. But if we would read the scriptures and we understand that there comes a severe judgment upon those who would teach. They might not all be so quick to go to Facebook and tell everybody how to live their life. And the pastor. But that's the world that we live in. There are people with voices that never should have the voice. And sadly, there are people who are listening to those voices who are being deceived and dissuaded from the truth and the reality of the Bible and, and the word of God. Here, Solomon, or David, he wasn't meant to build a house. He had it. In fact, he went to the prophet at the time. For him, it was Gad at this time. And uh, he goes, I want to build a house for the Lord. And the prophet said, do everything in your heart to do. But the prophet wasn't hearing from the Lord at that moment in time because the very next verse, the Lord corrected Gad and said, no, go tell David he can't build me a temple because of the blood in his life. He can gather the materials and this, this, and this. And he also says, I never asked for a temple from any of the people or leaders or kings that I've had before now. But I will allow his son to build it for me. So that's where we're at with Solomon. He's coming to build this temple. He's coming to build the temple of the Lord with the materials that David, his father, had gathered and in verse 7, he dedicates all the things that David had done. And he builds a temple. And in verse seven, chapter, one, or, 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 chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Now when Solomon made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. And verse 2, I believe the Lord wants us to come to verse 2 in this house. The priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. And later it talks about, I want you to enter the house of the Lord. But when the glory comes, it said they couldn't stand before his presence. They couldn't stand before the presence of the glory of the Lord. Do we know him in that way? But to know him in that way costs. It costs. Do you realize the value of this temple that Solomon built? I don't have the numbers before me because this is just off the, off the cuff here. I didn't look it up. I'm sure it would be billions and billions of dollars. The amount of gold, the amount of silver, the amount of bronze, the amount of livestock that was sacrificed in that place. The marble, the pillars, the linen, everything. This place was opulent out the wazoo. World renowned. A seven ancient wonder of the world. God doesn't do anything that does not have glory. In verse 11 of chapter 7 of 2 Chronicles, it says, Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house and all that came to Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house he prosperously effected. I love this. This is what I want for my life, for your life, for this body. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I've heard your prayer. And I have chosen this place you consecrated in me for myself as a place of sacrifice. Because see, Solomon was praying, Lord, when they look to this house, if they're being afflicted, deliver them. When they look to this house, if there's drought, bring rain. When they look to this house and pray and repent, forgive them. When they look to this house and there's pestilence in the land, heal their land. Solomon was praying all this prayer, and this is the Lord's response. He's saying, I will do all these things. I will do all these things, and I will, I will heal their land, and I will forgive them, and I will deliver them when they look to this house. In other words, the Lord was marking the house for his glory. We read it in verse 1 of chapter 7. The glory filled the house. Do we want a house full of the glory of the Lord? Absolutely. But here's the deal. If some of us are paying a cost and wanting to be the friends of God and some are not, here's the danger in that. When the Lord does fill the house with the glory, the danger is this. You can think that you're okay in the way that you're living because the Lord honored the house. Just because the Lord does a miracle here or in this house or ministers in this way in this house and maybe he used you in that regard doesn't mean he trusts you. He did it for the benefit of his people. And this has so struck me because I heard this and it pierced my heart. I don't want just a corporate outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want to be trusted by the Lord. I don't want just signs, wonders, and miracles. I want to be his friend. Look, the signs and wonders and miracles that happened, I, I love healing. I love the love of God. All of that is great. And to be truthfully, if you want to see more healing in your life, almost everyone that was healed, the thousands that Jesus healed were all unbelievers. Go out and pray for more unbelievers. 
You'll see more healings. The miracles, the signs, and the wonders, they don't build faith. We read about it already in 2 Peter chapter 1 at the end. Peter, James, and John were the Mount of Transfiguration. In one of the midst of one of the greatest miracles, other than the resurrection and you know, his virgin birth, they're watching the glory of the Lord start to shine through the skin of Jesus. His clothes can't take it. It's like lightning looking at his clothes. They're asleep. <laughs> There's no faith being built there. And then when they woke up in the middle of that instance and they saw this wonderful thing, Peter pipes up and he, said, and he answered when nobody asked, because that's Peter. And he said, Lord, this is great. Let me build three tabernacles, right? We, this is, we've done we this weeks ago. And God immediately intervened and said, this is my son, hear him. The focus is on Jesus. It's about hearing him. Mary sat at his feet. For the one needful thing, to hear his word, it says. And he shut down all the other thing and said, Peter, just know me. I just ask you to pray for me. When I say words like I love the Lord, it seems so shallow. It doesn't seem enough. It doesn't seem like it gives him what's properly his. I want to be a church that's called his friend, that he can trust us with his presence, with his glory, with his word, with his love to the people of this community, with his joy and hope. I don't want to be a church of condemnation. I want to be a church of truth. We ought to speak. Our words ought to be laced with grace but also in truth. I don't need to preach condemnation of sin. The Holy Spirit in my life, and this is something we'll get to probably next week now, but the Holy Spirit in my life already convicts people of sin around me, excluding myself. That's his job. What am I to preach? The love of Jesus, the way of salvation. The love of a Savior who died for us. If I come in contact with somebody who's living a lifestyle that, that is not according to the word of God and, and my job is not to tell them that, that, not to tell them that necessarily. My job is to tell them how much the Savior loves them, died for them, and wants to give them hope, victory, and life. And in that moment of sincerity, because that's something I'm probably sure they don't have, and they receive Jesus Christ, there will be an immediate conviction for the lifestyle changes that need to be made. That's how we are to be giving forth. But if I don't walk with Jesus, if I don't have a secret time where I bury my life in before him in secret, how am I going to know what to say? Why would the Lord trust me to bring them into my life to minister to them? You know, they say, well, the Lord doesn't have favorites. That's not true. He does have favorites. Otherwise, there would be no favor. I want to be one of his favorites. But it costs. I'm causing us day to. I'm going back to Second Peter chapter one, where it talks about growing and maturing. How do we grow and mature? Pay the cost to become his friend. Pay the cost to become his friend. It's worth it. Think about it. If Martinsville was going to be destroyed tomorrow by fire, like Sodom and Gomorrah, wouldn't you hope there was a friend in Martinsville of God's that he could go to and say, "Hey, like he did Abraham, I'm going to destroy Martinsville." And Abraham's like, "Whoa, wait a minute. There's good people. Can I get him out first? Yeah. I want to be that friend for you. I hope you want to be that friend for me. No, I don't believe the wrath of God, and again, is going to come upon those that he loves. I think that's clear in 2 Peter chapter 2, which looks like it might be next week. Let's continue reading here. It says, if I shut up the heaven that there is no rain, or if I command, this is God saying that, locusts to devour the land. Why is he commanding locusts to devour the land? Why is he shutting up heaven? Because we talked about it last week. The God of the Old Testament is still the God of the New Testament. There is a day of judgment coming for the ungodly. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.9, he reserves the unjust to the day of ju judgment. We don't like that verse, but it's New Testament and it's going to happen. He says, if my people who are called by my name, verse 14, chapter 7, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's the beginning of it, though. 
These are, these are unrepentant unbelievers. That's the beginning of it. The second part is becoming the friend of the Lord. And here's how you become the friend of the Lord. He continues to talk. Jesus, or God here to, Sam, uh, to Solomon. Mine eyes will be open. Mine ears will be attentive unto the prayer that is made in this place, the temple, where his glory is. Not just any church. He's got to be in that church. If he's not there, it's not a church at all. Jesus is the head of the church. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And mine eyes, mine heart will be there perpetually. That's the cry of my heart for Spirit of Life Church. The cry of my heart is that his eyes and his heart will be here perpetually because it's where his glory dwells. At first it dwells in us because Jesus is the glory of God. Hebrews 1 is very clear on that. And as for you, Solomon, this is how... This is part of the paying the cost to be his friend. As for you, Solomon, if you will walk before me like David, your father walked. That word walked is, is, is journeying on step by step and not looking back. What did Jesus say? You put your hand to the plow and you don't look back. That's the same word walk right here. He's saying if you walk in that regard day by day, following me, chasing after me. He says, and do according to all I've commanded you. So walk like David walked and do according to things I've commanded you and observe my statutes, my commandments, my judgments. Then I will establish the throne of your kingdom according as I have covenanted with David, your father, saying, there shall not fail one man to be a ruler in Israel. It's from his line. But if you turn away, you forsake my statutes and commandments, which I have set before you and shall go and serve other gods and worship them. Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them. And this house, which I have sanctified, this temple, I will cast out of my sight and make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. And this house, which is high, shall be an astonishment. People will will gasp at what became of it to everyone who passes by, so that he shall say, what has the Lord done to this land and this house? And it shall be answered because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped other gods and served other gods. Therefore, did this evil befall them. What kind of house do we want to be, Spirit of Life Church? We can't call ourselves a friend's church because it has a different meaning these days. But I want to be a friend of God. I want to be a church of the friend of God. I want to be a church that's willing to pay the cost for him to come here and to dwell in this place. I just finished a word study on glory. All the times glory was used in the scripture. It was a lot. And you know what the beautiful thing about glory is? It's tied with the fear of the Lord. So that's the next word study. I want to be a house that fears him. I started today with Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. He says, if I'm your father, where's my honor? And if I'm your master, where's my fear? Are we willing to give him the honor that is due his name? Are we willing to give him the fear that is due him? Because he's worthy of it. Are you willing today to pay the cost to be his friend? Because if you pray that prayer, a prayer we're just now getting ready to pray, I'm done, I'm not going any farther. If you pray that prayer to pay the cost to be his friend, then he's going to start drawing and giving you opportunities to come know him deeper and deeper still. But are we willing to pay that cost? I am. What's that cost look like? I've shared it with our leadership team. We've had a couple of meetings already with our elders and with our, with our leaders. And the cost is very simply that the Holy Spirit can do what he pleases in this house. But first, before it can be in this house, it has to be in us. It has to be in Pastor Adam and I. If we're not surrendered to the Lord, you have no hope. Because you know what the Lord does to honor? His word and he honors the authority he set in the house. You can't be in authority if you're not under authority. That's the first part. So we have to lay our lives down unto other people. And we have. 
But if we're not laying our lives down before the Lord and surrendered and asking the Holy Spirit to have his way and to change and to mark and to transform, consume, do away with, bring in whatever he pleases to the glory of Jesus Christ, then you guys should find another church. Because he won't be here. Because he's not being honored. That's true for every leader. Too often when we just speak ill of other leaders or too often we just speak ill of what's going on at the church. But what costs have we paid to be his friend, to be judgmental and critical? Look, if I criticize other ministries that I have no authority in, that will destroy my destiny. Why? It's a waste of breath. It's a waste of energy. It's easy for us to say things, but I believe the Lord is calling us right now to do things. Words are powerful. Scripture is clear, but words can also be cheap. Please stand with me. Hallelujah. Kimberly, you can go ahead and put some music on. I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. But simple doesn't mean it lacks power. The prayer is going to be along these regards. So you can prepare your heart whether you want to receive it or not. Because I challenge you, as I did when I started this series 96 weeks ago in first or in Second Peter, the first part of Second Peter was this. Are you willing to grow and mature? It says add to your faith virtue, add to your faith love, add to your faith self-control. And it goes through, are we adding to our faith? Right now, you know what we need to add to our faith? We need to pay that cost to become his friend. There's a deeper place, friends. There's a better place. There's a place where his love is so deep that when you sing to him, he sings back to you. There's a place where his love is so deep. When I was listening to something else and I prayed a prayer with another minister, I put my head down on my desk just like this. I put my head down on this, and I got such a holy vision in that moment of his eyes of fire. And then they went away, the fire, and I just saw these, these I can't even describe it. Words don't do it justice. These deep, compassionate, loving, fierce eyes looking right at me and saying, I have you. I own you. You are mine. I've never felt better in my life than in that moment. Do you long for more of him? Not my experiences. That's personal. I shared it with you. You're not going to get much more after that. Because it's personal between me and the Lord. But do you have these deep wells that you're digging with the Lord that you can always go back to that will never Never be filled in by the Philistines, by the enemy. But will always be open and allow the living water, the river of the Holy Spirit to flow through you because you know and you are marked. It says in Ephesians 4.30 that you are sealed and you are marked to the day of redemption. That means that you have been royally branded. It means when God looks down here, he sees who he's marked. Now that's regarding his salvation, but I also want to be marked with the experiences that I've had with the Lord. Not greater than his word, but because of his word. Oh, friends, God is so longing for people who will come to him to a deeper and a new place. He wants more friends. In a day and age where people are leaving church left and right to sit at home, sip coffee, and watch something on the internet. Friends, that will not work for an eternity. The Lord could reach through TV. He did with me. First time I watched Benny Hinn on TV, I don't care what you think of him. That's irrelevant. I just wept. You know what that made me want to do? It made me want to be in the room where God was actually doing and showing forth his glory. So I'm going to pray over you, then I'm going to release you. As I, before I pray, prayer team, you can go ahead and come on up, please. The prayer team is here. We have needs you need minister to. They're here to pray with you and agree with you on that. Don't leave. When I'm done praying, you are dismissed, though. Uh, feel free to go get your children. Simple prayer about paying the cost. Oh, let's just go ahead and close your eyes and bow our heads and put our focus on the Lord. I pray even now that He's showing you His eyes like He showed me. Those beautiful eyes. 
I wrote in my journal just two big words, all caps. It took five lines of the pages. Those eyes. I had no words to describe it. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that there would be a revelation in the heart of everyone who is hungry right now. That they would see those loving, passionate eyes that desire friendship with him. I pray right now, Lord God, to everyone whose heart is willing and desiring to pay a new cost, not the cost of salvation, because we can't pay that cost. You did, Jesus, but to pay the cost of friendship, to pay the cost to willing like Moses to face every insecurity of our life. Maybe that's losing friends. He lost friends on both sides of the aisle when Moses was living his life and following you. Maybe it's to pay the cost of of Abraham and to move away from relationships, even though they may be family that are a hindrance to walking with you, Lord. Maybe it's the cost of going to a new land. Maybe it's the cost of leaving the old one. Maybe it's the cost of turning aside from our daily activities when the burning bush is calling us and you're calling us out of it to come spend time with you. And I guarantee it's probably going to be when we feel it's inconvenient. So Father, I just pray right now by your Holy Spirit that those who are hungry, who are desiring the more of you, Lord, who want to be your friends, not just saved, that's a free gift and we receive it, but want to be your friends, that right now you would mark them for friendship path. That you do a mighty work in your lives by your Holy Spirit, putting your finger on all things that you desire to change, do away with, or bring in. In Jesus' name, amen.